all, may I just say thank you, thank you very much, Messi Goku, for the invitation to, to join this colloquy. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful experience. This was, this was my life, as I think Marcus maybe just said for three years, or rather this was my life. Um, now, on here, I brought this along. This, this is my friend. <laughs> for three years, he was my friend. Um, this is, I guess, slightly bigger than the actual manuscript. Twice. Twice. I, I was privileged to go uh, along to, uh, to the Vatican Library to have a look at this. As Marcus says, it's twi this is twice the size. So to try and get an idea how on earth you get into this, uh, it was just a, an, an incredible piece of work that was taking place and just an, an incredible experience to be part of the project. Yes. So, um, I have a Ian Richardson uh, uh, nous a dit que ça c'était sa vie pour quelques années, cette page, parce que la page qui est beaucoup plus grande que le, le code de codex euh, lui-même, euh, vous verrez, c'est une, une page qui montre euh, le texte de, de ces questions, la première question, et vous voyez dans les marges, on a, on a des... des des notes, des commentaires sur cette question euh, du 15e et 16e siècle. Et c'est très extraordinaire parce que on a, dans les 500 pages de, de, de ce manuscrit, on a très peu de, 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 de commentaires dans les marges. Mais tout de suite, avec les questions de, de, des cas, on a vraiment comme un, une, une explosion de commentaires qui fait encore plus dur de, de, de lire les textes. Just to give you that idea uh, of the scale, and you now have that in front of you. Is this working? I have a switch ah, off. Là, vous voyez le texte. Alors, le texte de, de la question, c'est le texte au milieu. Il y a deux. Euh, comment vous dites Deux marches. Deux marches. Alors, Là, c'est une marche, il y a encore une autre marche. Ici, c'est plein d'écritures du 15e siècle. Au contraire, ça, c'est du 14e siècle. Et ça commence juste en. Voilà, au trône, en hypothèse, c'est dans une déo. Et on, on ne voit pas dans la marge, on ne voit pas. On ne voit pas. La note ici, vous voyez, en dessous, il y a un M qui dit maître. Mais on n'a pas su euh, quel nom c'était. Et c'était la raison, parce qu'on n'a pas pu lire ça, que euh, les, les collègues, dont euh, Krabman et Pelsa, euh, ils ont pensé que c'est un autre maître. Au contraire, parce qu'il y a une, une autre question de ce manuscrit qu'on a attribué à un écart avant déjà, mais on a pensé que cette M ici nous donne une autre autorité qu'on n'a pas pu viser euh, ou lire. Euh, et c'est pour cela qu'on a pensé que ces questions ne sont pas d'écart. Mais les collègues n'ont pas, à l'époque, n'ont pas vu que la personne qui a fait ces, ces corrections, ou les, les, les commentaires dans la marge, celui qui a érasé le nom du maître ici, l'a mis ici, et voilé M. A. Maître Alexandre. Alors, le maître Alexandre, euh, nous connaissons deux maîtres Alexandre, et un des maîtres Alexandre a nous donné une question qui répond à cette question d'écart et qui pose l'opposite de cette question. Et pas mal de fois dans ce manuscrit, on a dans les marges les maîtres qui font ou qui disent l'opposite de, de ces maîtres-là. Et aussi, ils pourraient, je pense que Rappmann et aussi Pelzer pourraient, euh, euh, vu euh, ou voir à, à l'époque que ce n'était pas le nom d'un maître qui a écrit ces, ces questions parce que la page avant 
où on a le maître écart comme autorité, le maître n'est pas mis dans la marge, mais au-dessus. Alors les maîtres, les nouveaux maîtres, pas toujours, mais très souvent, le nom, non, c'est pas dans la marge, mais c'est en top, <rire> au-dessus de, de la question. Et c'est pour ça, c'était des, des, des raisons extérieures euh, qui nous ont aidé de, de découvrir que c'est vraiment euh, le, le même maître écart qui était mentionné euh, la page euh, avant, qui est aussi l'autorité de ces questions ici. Alors, ce, ce sont des... Euh, des raisons extérieures, pas intérieures. Mais maintenant, on va voir les raisons intérieures. <laughs> ok. Um, I, I love Marcus's uh, enthusiasm for, for this piece of uh, text from all these years ago. And uh, for me, it is infectious. Uh, and so I, I caught the infection from Marcus. Uh, so I, I, uh, I hope we can pass something of this. To, to you this morning. Uh, Questio 6, let me just leave it on, uh, on there. Questio 6, whether omnipotence, which is in God, should be considered as absolute power or as directed power, potentia absolutam or potentia ordinatam. This was not a new question. In fact, a very old question. These abbreviated notes taken by Prosper de Regio on the surface give us a straightforward answer from Meister Eckhart, but this question had been a razor-sharp political and ecclesiastical tool over the centuries, and all attending this particular quad libet, maybe around 1312, would be preparing to go into both uncharted and potentially dangerous territory with their astute master. The atmosphere would have been electric as Eckhart formulated omnipotence concisely, yet possibly beyond any previous treatment to that day. Eckhart firstly explained how we should consider power as both potentiality and actuality, both intrinsic and extrinsic. Power could be considered as an attribute, but for Eckhart, God is beyond attribute. His power is beyond measure. More precisely, God is power beyond measure. This maxim actus, uh, the actuality of the highest degree, this is total power in action, not just superior, but perfect. And this is not just potentiality. Power emanates from God, the origin, the source, the principle of all, in one singular particular action, so that all that is actualized is this stream of power flowing from God. Boom. <laughs> I have to say, when I just get hold of this, this, uh, this idea of Eckhart's uh, presentation of who God is, of God's power, then I, I can't just sit and think, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> I have to say, whoa, this, this, this is the reality of, of God's power. So, having established God's power as his overflowing uh, essence, Eckhart now feels able to move on to the question that has featured since patristic times, and he is not slow to show that he departs from the relative security of previous commentators. He refers to Augustine, among the biggest hitters of the early church. He refers to Peter Lombard, author of the first widely adopted medieval textbook, The Sentences, and thereby the plumb line used in all early, all early universities. And also, most significantly, he, he challenges the theology of Thomas Aquinas. He dares to do that. Okay, as the second Meister to hold the chair of theology in Paris twice, following Thomas, there are inevitable comparisons to be made. Without mentioning Thomas directly, Eckhart clearly used him as his point of reference to show that he was going beyond where Thomas and others had feared to tread. I use the word fear carefully, because bad theology could lead to charges of heresy. But being on the wrong side 
in a power struggle could also lead to even more serious consequences. The debate framed by the idea that God had the power to do everything but surely wouldn't was covered by Augustine who emphasised that there must be certain things God can't do because that would be an inappropriate uh, and therefore not within God's will. So from this point Abelard concluded that maybe God's power only reached to doing the things God will to do. But this perceived limitation on God's power was then a catalyst for Lombard and successive treatments to explore how God must be able to do more. Alexander of Hales presented the idea of there being more power than is ever actualized, although it could never be that God would act outside the potentia ordinata. Don Scotus proposed God could act outside of existing law through his absolute power, but this would still be within the ordinata. However, in moments of political wrangling, with state and church looking to establish sovereignty, the question of acting beyond the ordained will became the ability to act outside of existing law. And not just the fight for political supremacy, because within the church there was conflict, clergy versus mendicant, mendicant versus mendicant, and even rivalry within a mendicant order. With power at stake, the discussion about how God actualizes power was a tool to be employed in any bid to grasp power. Maybe je, je fais un summary, hein? Okay. Oui. Euh, juste euh, un, 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 un sommaire très court. Hein? C'est ce que euh, Ian nous dit ici que, premièrement, c'était pas une question nouvelle, la question du pouvoir de Dieu. Euh, soit un pouvoir absolu ou un pouvoir euh, restreint ou, ou, ou plein ou euh, plein euh, directed directionné voilà parce que au Moyen Âge c'est devenu une question du pouvoir non pas du pouvoir de Dieu mais aussi du pouvoir de des institutions qui se refèrent à Dieu, c'est-à-dire la question du pouvoir du roi, de l'empereur, la question de l'église et du, du pape, euh, des évêques, des prêtres, des ordres. Et c'est pour cela que c'était une question qui était vraiment politique. Et on voit ça particulièrement dans le XIIIe siècle, quand cette question était toujours entendue et discutée plus dans, le, dans, le, dans les sujets de, de, de la juridiction que dans euh, le domaine ou dans le domaine euh, de la métaphysique. Mais ce que les maîtres dites ou disent dans la métaphysique avait tout de suite une relation pour euh, les domaines juridiques et pratiques. There is a vast background to, to this question. This morning, all we can do is focus mostly on, on the question, uh, but the, the background to what was taking place is, 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 is vast and, for me, very interesting anyway. Uh, Eckhart negotiated through the debate by explaining how the matter of perspective was important. He could see no reason to limit God, and so God's power should be considered as potentia absoluta. However, because from our angle we comprehend God through his attributes, then in this sense God's power must be seen as directed. This wasn't a new idea. I use uh, to translate ordinata as directed because this combines the idea of being within the will of the one exerting power while referring to the actual things being done and importantly accentuating that this power is operational. 
rather than any number of particular actions that are within the will of God, because power is actualized in this one singular potential action, which is all directed, if you like, all actualized. I mean, for Eckhart, there's no debate. At this point, the Meister in his quadly bet could say, okay, thank you, that's it, thanks for coming. Um, he's, he's explained what power is and there's no debate. However, he didn't. Um, this is where our received notes, our repetatio, show he expanded uh, his, his argument in a way that it was essentially radical to his predecessors. He did this by focusing on two logical hurdles presented by Alexander of Hales like this. Let it be noted that God can do all things which to be able to do does not come down to either not being able or not befitting. God could potentially do more than he chooses to do so any limitation is self-imposed. These are the questions of whether something is possible or non-contradictory and whether something would be appropriate or morally right. The first one is easy. Not just actuality, but potentiality can only refer to something that doesn't imply that a contradiction would be involved in order for it to happen. This is not about... Uh, limiting God is deemed to be impossible from the Hebrew scriptures onwards by suggesting there's anything God couldn't do, but stating there is nothing that could possibly be done that God couldn't do. Nothing and everything are mutually opposed, contradictions sum to nothing, and so any thought that God's power might be limited because of not actually doing something are, are unfounded. Anything that is actually a thing is possible. And God, within Eckhart's model, actually does it. Whereas earlier commentators had not gone beyond the idea that there might be some unutilized capacity in God, Eckhart doesn't hold this concern from his definition of power, the singularity maxim axis. I'll keep going, Marcus, until you oh. come in. Yeah, keep it going. Go okay. on a bit, Tim, and then I summarise. Okay. Having cleared this first hurdle, Eckhart once again applies his notion of power to negotiate the second. It was always assumed that God wouldn't behave out of character. This is the filter of right action or moral possibility. When considering power, God acts in a way that people act, except with perfection. So everything he actually does must be done perfectly and be perfectly right for him to do. All God does must be de chens, is the word in the text, translated uh, as befitting, something that fits God, uh, is, is right for him, according to his essence, the nature of his being. But if there are things that are possible that God cannot do, then all of God's potentiality is not being utilised. This limitation was presented by Augustine. I can tell you the sort of things God couldn't do. He can't die. He cannot sin. He cannot lie. He cannot be deceived. He said, this is what Augustine said, and we had things like, uh, God couldn't cheat at poker. Um, such things God doesn't do, because if so, he would not be omnipotent. He does whatsoever he wills. That connection is always there for Augustine between the will of God and the power of God. Although being omnipotent meant possessing the power to do all things, God only does what he wills. So he could not will to do certain things that would be unbefitting. Into medieval times, Lombard added a nuance. God is able to do many things which are not good, because they will not be, they'll neither happen, if you like, they, they neither are, nor they will be. A slight nuance there. Um, so Lombard, in a move to distinguish himself from Abelard, uh, suggests God could have done more than he does, 
but the things that would not have been fitting to do don't exist. God would be able to do more than he does if they were possible. Note, this links the two hurdles together with the conclusion, God must have potential to do more than he actually does. Likewise, Thomas, careful not to limit God. Thomas proposed, it must be said that it is impossible that God should do something and that this be unbefitting. However, he is able to make it so that something which is unbefitting according to one order is made befitting according to another order. It was as if within our creation now, within this order of time and creation and life as we know it, God couldn't, but uh, there may be some order somewhere else in which he could. That, that was Thomas's way of not wanting to be seen to be restricting God. So a self-imposed, um, sorry, I'll go, Thomas confirmed only acts de potentia ordinata, actualizing only what is befitting. But he did suggest God could do things differently in, in some other order. A self-imposed limitation placed on God by Augustine was here being affirmed by Thomas, who was bold enough to maintain elsewhere, as with Albert. When considering God's essence, there's no difference between actuality and potentiality. But in terms of the things that could actually be done, even God is restricted by this present order of time and creation. Alors le problème euh, majeur était que Dieu, comme euh, tout puissant, bien tout puissant, euh, est-ce qu'il y a des restrictions pour lui Et une des restrictions était euh, qu'il ne peut pas faire des choses qui ne sont pas propres ou pas euh, propres pour lui, comme euh, euh, mendiquer. Mentir ou euh, déception, ou des choses comme ça. Alors, ce que Dieu peut, peut faire, comme August, Augustin nous dit, c'est que Dieu fait ce qu'il peut, et ce qu'il peut, c'est toujours propre euh, comme son essence. Alors, la deuxième question, c'était, est-ce que Dieu peut faire plus que ce qu'il veut, sans faire ce qu'il ne veut pas Alors, est-ce que la toute-puissance inclut vraiment tous et tout, sans qu'il qu qu le fait, parce que ce n'est pas propre pour lui Et ça, c'était des questions qui, qui étaient euh, discutées, euh, comme... Euh, Nodi ou Abela et autres ont, ont fait un développement de cette discussion euh, afin que Thomas d'Aquin nous dise que oui, Dieu pourrait faire plus parce qu'il a une, euh, une potentialité, une, un pouvoir absolu. Mais tout ce qu'il fait en réalité, c'est euh, son pouvoir qui est dirigé, qui est dirigé par sa volonté, comme euh, Augustin nous a dit, c'est-à-dire la réalité de ce que Dieu fait, c'est toujours propre. Même s'il pourrait faire quelque chose qui est impropre, des fois, d'un certain perspective, que nous voyons les choses, les orages, les guerres, on pense que ce n'est pas propre pour Dieu, d'être de, euh, derrière ces actions. Mais si on le voit d'une autre perspective, on voit que ce qui se passe dans le monde, c'est vraiment proprement dirigé par, par Dieu. Alors, dans l'essence, il admet que l'actualité, ce que Dieu fait, et la potentialité, tout ce qu'il pourrait faire, c'est la même chose parce qu'on ne peut pas faire la différence. Mais tout ce que Dieu fait, 
il fait seulement comme et du pouvoir, d'un pouvoir qui est toujours dirigé, qui est toujours proprement à, euh, euh, comme Dieu le, le, le fait. Alors, on, on va voir, euh, Thomas d'Aquin, c'est comme un sommaire de toute la tradition, parce que toute la tradition que nous connaissons dit que Dieu seulement agit de son pouvoir dirigé. Il n'est jamais non dirigé. C'est toujours dirigé. Et jamais juste de son pouvoir absolu. Ok, Henry of Ghent, just to finish this section, Henry of, of Ghent typified uh, the general opinion of this, the late 13th century, stating because God cannot do what is not good, he cannot do what is not decent. Whatever he makes is appropriate for him to make, and whatever he makes and is able to make, if it were appropriate to make it, would be made decently and in order. So God cannot do what is unbefitting for him to do. But if it were, then it would be befitting. We can go as far as that. As before, there is the insistence that whatever God does is befitting. There is no sense that anything would be unbefitting for God to do is ever actualized. Enter the Meister. As Grabman realised, as, as Marcus spotlighted, Eckhart moved irresistibly to say God, de potentia absoluta, could do what is not befitting. More than that, he could do it now. In language evocative of Henry, he states that if something that had been perceived as unbefitting for God to do were actually done by God, then it would be befitting. This is in the here and now. Being decens, therefore, involves a temporal aspect, though only as a matter of perspective, in that something that was seen as unbefitting could now be seen as befitting. Here, Eckhart could well be dismantling the notions of his predecessors, who, as far as he is concerned, effectively place a self-imposed moral limitation on what God actualizes. This is not God permitting something bad to happen. Neither has he set a, a different moral code for himself than his creation, nor is he miraculously transforming something bad into something good. Rather, this could mean God acting in a manner that seems unbefitting to creation within the sphere of time. In this case, the whole idea of how creation perceives an action as befitting is only relevant to creation. Power can be thought of as absoluta, irrespective of utilization, because it is all utilized in the singular outward and return flow of God, the bulitio and ebulitio. Eckhart proposed God acts continually in the eternal now, the nunc dimittis, sorry, nunc eternitas, meaning there is no distinction between bulitio and ebulitio, but one absolute actualizing action. This means God's singularity maximaxis is always pure, always befitting, because that is the nature of his action. Because it is one action, it is paradoxically for creation both temporal and atemporal, and above all, it has direction. How is this thought that outward and inward flow are effectively in one direction justified? Prosper's notes say no more, so we can't, they're not definitive in themselves. But with supplementary texts, Eckhart's thoughts can be presumed confidently. From German Sermon 52. Let God perform what he will, and let man be free. Everything that ever came from God is directed into pure activity. No, the action of God ends in purity. 
We've already said it comes from God, so it's pure, but it ends in God, so it's pure. Uh, if, some, if God does something, it's pure. As, as Paul said to Titus, to the pure, all things are pure. And from Latin Sermon 28, which coincidentally contains fragments of text parallel to questions five and six, um, Eckhart states, God alone as first universal cause makes everything. Everything is made through him. That's from James. Again, he alone makes everything good as the universal end of all things. And further, because God makes something, he makes it good and it is good. Further, however, only the final end, which is also the first end itself, makes something good both because only that one is properly the end and because anything that is in whatever way conceived as being not directed towards this end is not a good in itself and things are good in themselves only if they are in whatever way redirected towards it again when something is ordained or directed by god then it is also redirected towards God. And so it is good because all that returns to God is good. We perceive things as bad in the here and now, but in the reality of atemporality, God's power is directed towards the good end. As Marcus writes, Eckhart develops an understanding of good and bad with regards to the primary and ultimate end. God doing everything does not mean that everything he makes is good now, because what is something is now is not its real essence. Conversely, what is indecent now is not indecent by its nature, but if it is directed towards the good end, it becomes good. For Eckhart, God's potentia ordinata, directed power, is just the emanation the potentia absoluta of absolute power. More than that, God is able to do all that is logically possible, and whether or not it is morally possible should not be taken as a restriction. It is not God choosing whether or not to do something. This is power, both in God himself and so in all his action. From God's essence, God's power is actualized. It is directed in action and is indistinct from God. The Meister takes us into God's perspective from which there is no distinction. Even if the filters that seem to limit God's power are real from a human perspective, restricting God according to self-imposed choice based on laurel, sorry, logical or moral possibility is not decision making from a divine view but a reflection on human limitations in comprehending God. La solution de Descartes prend euh, euh, Henri de Ghent comme vraiment comme le début hein parce qu'il répète euh, vraiment Henri de Ghent pensant sur euh, le pouvoir parce que déjà Henri de Ghent a pensé sur la euh, non-propriété de, de, des actions. Henri aussi a déjà pensé sur euh, la proximité de, la, du pouvoir absolu et du pouvoir dirigé de Dieu. Mais Eckhart va un, un peu plus loin que Henri de Gant. Et il pense que tout ce que Dieu fait, il fait non pas du pouvoir dirigé, mais tout ce que Dieu fait, il, tout touche, il fait du pouvoir absolu. Parce qu'on ne peut pas faire de différence en Dieu. Et c'est pour cela qu'il critique la différenciation entre une, un pouvoir absolu et un pouvoir dirigé. Je peux dire que euh, Courtenay, un des grands maîtres euh, sur cette question de, 
de la, du pouvoir absolu et dirigé, nous dit dans son livre, sans connaître ces questions nouvelles des cas, qu'il n'y avait personne au, euh, dans le Moyen-Âge euh, qui a osé dire que Dieu euh, fait quelque chose de, du pouvoir absolu. Corneille nous dit que le pouvoir absolu, c'est un, un, un concept abstrait. Et que tout le monde, tous les théologiens, tous les philosophes, étaient de la position que Dieu agit toujours seulement de, du pouvoir dirigé. Or, on a trouvé ici euh, la grande exception, parce que pour euh, Eckhart, comme euh, il nous montre, Dieu agit toujours du pouvoir absolu. Et il est le seul qui dit ça. Et il dit que, comme il nous dit, que le pouvoir dirigé, ce que Dieu fait, en effet, devient de ce pouvoir absolu. Et s'il y a des restrictions, ce sont seulement les restrictions temporelles ou les restrictions catégoriques. Et ce sont les restrictions que nous, les humains, les créatures, imposent à Dieu parce que nous ne comprenons pas le pouvoir absolu. C'est-à-dire, si nous voyons des choses qui sont horribles et que nous disons que ça ne peut pas être de Dieu, c'est notre problème et pas le problème de Dieu. Et on verra ça, ça a beaucoup d'implications sur les questions du mal, sur les questions du diable, sur la question de l'enfer. Mais ça va euh, plus loin qu'il nous a approchés là. Il est un prêtre, il y a des restreints humains. On n'est pas dans la perspective de Dieu. C'est la fin de Ian qui nous dit euh, le problème de nous, c'est que nous voyons Dieu toujours de notre perspective.